So glad to have you joining us for another episode of Curiosity Not Judgment. Welcome. My name is Birga. And I'm Gary. So at the time of this recording, it is election day. It is 316 on election day, mountain time. And so I know we have many, many hours before the end of the day when the polls close, but there already is a great sense of anticipation about what's going to happen. What is the turnout going to be? What are the decisions going to be? I know we've had some conversations in my little circle that uh, we probably won't even know tomorrow who's president. It's going to take a week. I don't know. It's anybody's guess at this point. And it's kind of funny to think that somebody's going to be watching this in the future and maybe there is resolution. But I thought it was really important for us to talk a little bit about the situation at hand and the divide in the country and what happens if your candidate is not the one who got the win. Well, odds are that half the country is going to be in that exact situation. Indeed. You said anticipation. I would say uh, there's also a fair degree of anxiousness. Yes. And I think anxiousness is where we can get ourselves in trouble. And, and the more anxious I am, um, the more I sometimes don't act at my at my best. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really do think that this election is putting miracle grow on our differences in opinions, in in. Um, I mean, I think, I hope we all want what's best for, you know, America, for the U.S., for the economy, for all of our own well-beings, our quality of life. I think we differ greatly in how to get there. Mm -hmm. well, and um, and I think these two candidates probably, um, you know, portray the, the differences that we all feel. And so... Um, you know, one can argue about the two-party system. Uh, I, I always I love Winston Churchill's quote, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Mm -hmm. And um, and and here we are. We At least we are in a situation where we can vote. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny to me that we are in a situation in America where we uh, we can vote, but it's not compulsory. Many right. countries have compulsory voting. My wife is from Brazil, and you must vote. If you don't, there are penalties. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Uh, you you can't travel. You your passport is no good. Your I mean they they have things that they do if you miss uh, two elections in a row, wow. and so um, or two elections period, and so. Um, so, you know, we're in a, a situation where we can vote, we don't have to vote. And, uh, and it's going to be interesting because if, some people will choose not to. Sure. Uh, some people will choose not to vote for one of the two parties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then there's the whole thing about is that a throwaway vote or are, or do people listen to that? Is mm -hmm. that consequential in any way? So there's a lot going on. Yeah. I voted early and I was actually quite surprised to see that there were seven options on the presidential ballot. Yeah. And so that that caught me by surprise. I voted a few weeks ago. I was surprised at that, too. Yeah. But I think where we want to go today in the curious vein is how do we move forward? Let's assume, again, as you said, half the country is going to be upset with the results of this election. And so if you find yourself in the half that is upset, how do we posture ourselves in a curious way that we are making good in, well, I, I got to be careful with that statement, that, that we're making decisions that would lead towards healthy relationships, healthy interactions at work, and the ability to move forward in a way where we can let our position and our posture down a little bit so that we can kind of reincorporate into a fuller whole society. And I know yeah. that was a lot of word salad there, but I think you know where I'm getting at. Yeah, and reintegrating to a whole society, that's funny. Because you're right, um, the, 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 in, the intonation there is, is that we are not a whole society right now. We're kind of fractured and split. And I think that's there's some truth to that. Um, but, you know, you say half the country is going to be upset. I think half the country will say it wasn't the person I voted for. Mm. I think it's our choice as to whether to be upset. Ah. And um, and I think that there's, I think there's, you know, just guessing on this now. Don't, don't, don't say this is a quote or I've got any hard science. But 
there's probably a lot of people who are like, ah, it's not the person I voted for, but you know, the sun will come up tomorrow and the country, you know, the, the president doesn't have all of the weight of everything, the direction this country goes anyway. There's, mm -hmm. there's two other branches. There's other, there's a lot of inertia. There's a lot of things that are going on. You know, they kind of sway and tilt, but they don't determine. Uh, and we're not going to make a 90 degree turn in any one direction. Mm -hmm. anytime soon um and so you know may, many people may not have, may not be the person that they voted for but may not be upset i think it's a it's a two-part thing it's not the person i voted for it's my choice as to what i do with that mm, i think that is such an important distinction not making the you know predetermined choice that if i don't have the victor then i'm going to be mad at the world right to say okay it didn't go the way that I anticipated. Now what? What is my reaction? What is my responsibility as an individual? I think that's a great first question. Yeah, you know, we always get the few people who every election say, oh, if so-and-so wins, I'm moving out of the country. Right. Okay, fine. That's one response, right? Um, but I, you know, I'm always one of those that, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> and if you disenfranchise yourself, well, then you don't really have much to say about well what what's going to be in the future and you know quite frankly it doesn't matter who wins there's still going to be processes by which our voices can be heard yeah. processes by which we decide as a country what we're going to do with respect to policy with respect to law with respect to regulations mm -hmm. and um and i think that you know throwing up your hands and being upset or i should say to where you were going earlier, being upset is not necessarily going to help you reintegrate and still have influence on those processes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there are a lot of divides that happen around political seasons. And if you need any evidence of that, you can simply log into Facebook or Instagram or any of those where people are putting statements, pretty strong statements, and looking at the comments that fall afterwards. And, you know, this bleeds into the workplace, this bleeds into family division, and you can really quickly build a divide between individuals based on a political stance. And so once the election is finally said and done, once, once the declaration has been made, this person is president, it's been authorized, it's been checked, whatever, we do have to live our days after that. And we do have to figure out what comes next. And so if there has been this series of broken relationships over the past months, I would hope, I would ask, you know, could could some of the beginning curious questions that you begin to ponder in these weeks ahead be, how do I restore relationships that have been damaged or lost because of political divide? Yeah, and, and you know, there's, we talk about sore losers and sore winners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can I reach out um, regardless of the situation to others around me and provide aid and comfort and, um, and, and, you know, an, an easy environment yeah. with which to either, you know, voice frustrations or voice joy or whatever. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that this, the key in my mind is to understand that choice part of it and mm -hmm. to say, look, um, it is every single meeting I go into, every single human interaction I go into, every single interaction I have with a uh, with with any constituent, um, I have a choice as to how I approach things and what I do. And um, you know, this is not going to be a time for gloating. It's not going to be a time for wringing your hands. Yeah, I guess you could choose those options. Sure. I'm not sure they're the most useful. No, I think that's that's a, a good perspective to take. So as we're looking at the, you know, the days ahead, whether you have a hopeful outlook or a pessimistic one, I think it really does begin with the internal questions about what is my role? What are my next steps? What are the relationships that I need to foster or restore or cultivate? Because really the emphasis of this whole hundred and some odd episodes of this podcast series has been around how do we do life together? How do we do relationship well? How do we posture ourselves 
in a curious way so that we're not letting judgment cause more friction and more divide than is already present. And so I do think there's a, a host of curious questions that we can all begin to ask internally. And, you know, maybe there hasn't been friction in your little circle. And that's great. I hope I hope there hasn't been. But, you know, based on the statistics I'm seeing, I think chances are you've got at least somebody upset with you. Right. And if it's not your little immediate circle of family and friends, is there some hostile feelings going on in the workplace? And what is your role, if any, to build bridges among your peers and your colleagues in your workspace? Well, let's think about it from an individual relationship perspective. I think some curious questions would be, um, hey, I'm about to go into this meeting with so-and-so. Let's just make it a work meeting just to make mm -hmm. it easy. Um, I think it's fine to ask the question is, you know, what is the context of this meeting? And what is the environment that's going to be in here? And specific to this specific podcast, is there going to be an influence on that environment and context because of, you know, who won or lost and, and, uh, and, or who I was for, if that's known, mm -hmm. I try very hard to make that not known, but you know, some people are, uh, are right out there with what's right. going on. And so, you know, what can I do? What can I bring into this meeting that will help us achieve the real objectives of the meeting? What is the real objective of the meeting? Yeah. And, and, and how can we move aside the distractions as quickly as possible or as effectively as possible is probably a better way to say it. Some people may need to wring their hands. Some people may need to grieve. Some people may need to express joy. Uh, let them, you know, do that and then get on with it. Maybe sometimes moving past things isn't to ignore it, uh, but to just embrace it and then you can move on, right? And and so I, I guess any, on, on any given interaction, what's the context? Mm -hmm. uh, is there going to be an influence on that context based on what's just gone on yeah. in the election? And then what can I choose to do about that to to move past it and get to the objective of what the meeting's about? You know, I'm I'm picturing this line of questioning actually happening. And so if you were to say to somebody, is the outcome of the election going to have any bearing on our meeting? That would be a bold thing to ask, but it'd be an <laughs> older thing to answer. It's like, yep, we're going to get into it. You're like, well, thanks <laughs> for not accept your meeting request, right? Right. Um, but yeah, it's a, that's a one that makes me nervous even to think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, I'd rather know. Sure. I mean, if it's going to come up, I'd like to have thought about it a little bit ahead of time, right? I yeah. mean, there's many times, uh, just yesterday, I was in a, I was in a meeting where uh, somebody says, holy crap, that's a big deal. And I said, well, I, yes, it is. But wouldn't you rather know now? Wouldn't you rather deal with it now ahead of time versus be surprised about it yeah. uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, I'll think of an example this week. My wife's going to go in for a diagnostic and she got a text. And so we called ahead to ask some particulars. And um, the person says, oh, by the way, there's going to be this outrageous copay. And I said, what? And so we got to the billing department, figured out why and has to do with deductibles and all this other stuff. But I said, hey, you know, I'd rather know ahead of time and have dealt with it than be sitting there at the desk um, waiting to be seen. And someone says, oh, by the way, you owe this. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and so, you know, sometimes it's much better to know ahead of time then not know, right? So Certainly. if you think it's going to be germane to the meeting, you should do that regardless of the situation or this particular circumstance yeah. uh, that could be there. And this might be one of them. Yeah. You know, there may be situations both personally and professionally where you are the kind of the neutral party. You're the peacemaker and you're seeing people around you that are really, you know, geared up, because of all that has transpired. And so I think there's also going to be opportunity to think through some curious questions about how do you lead or help redirect conversation when tempers are hot? How do you help bring back kind of that neutral space where you can work together on whatever it is, again, personal or professional in the, in the aftermath of all that has gone on? And so 
anything come to mind kind of in that vein about the, the peacemaking space? You know, I love the Native American parable about the the wolf and which wolf are you going to feed, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to I don't want to necessarily give this too much feeding. In other words, um, you know, why would you deal with this more than any other thing that's distracting you from your objective in the meeting? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and how do you deal with anything else that's like that that comes up in a meeting that isn't germane? to the decision or the information sharing or whatever you're trying to do that's the objective of the meeting. And that is, you know, the good old parking lot or yeah. the write it down, we'll deal with it later. The yeah. the let's set that aside. Can we deal with that offline and get back to this? I, I, I don't know why we wouldn't deal with it the same way as we would any other thing that might be coming in as a distraction. No, that's a really great point. You know, I, I think we've all built this up so high in our minds. Like it is the end all be all thing, the breaking news that's going to impact the world, right? But is it? And does it need to be? Does it need to take that level of authority kind of in your family, in your home, in your workplace? I think that's a really great question that you just posed there. So if we come to the point of, no, we're not going to let this impact and derail our productivity, we're not going to let this impact and derail our relationships, then the next series of curious questions really have to be about, okay, how, how do we make up? How do we start having conversation around things outside of the political sphere? How do we get back to that point of connection? And I know you and I had done an episode months and months ago, but talking about even if it's the smallest point of connection that we can find, there is something very important about us as human beings wanting to find that place. If it's a matching breakfast cereal, cereal that you both eat, you guys both drive the same you know, type of car, your enthusiasts around the same sports team, whatever that point of connection is to start to seek that out again, because we want to figure out ways that we are alike especially when we've been concentrating on ways that we are different. Absolutely. And I use that uh, uh, all the time to establish uh, relationships with people. Um, today, I was on a phone call with uh, two people I'd never met before. And and I always say, so, you know, where, where are you guys? I mean, you're on a Zoom meeting. Where are you today, right? And uh, and is that where you live? And 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 those kinds of things. And you know, one person was from the D.C. area, and I can say, oh, you know, I graduated from Lake Braddock in Annandale. You know, my dad was at the Pentagon, and I've I've lived in that area. Oh, really? I'm right next door to Annandale and Alexandria. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, or and then you know, the other person was somewhere from somewhere else where I've lived. Now I've lived a lot of places, so that's an easy one for me, and it's probably one of the reasons I lead with it. Yeah. But. Um, you know, it is, it's easy to find those connections if we want to be creative and think about it and do it. And there's things you notice on, on in the background of people. I can look up there and see what's written on your, on your picture over there and, and, and see, you know, maybe start a conversation about that. You know, one of the things that you, when you come into someone's office and you see a bunch of frogs on the desk, it's like, oh, you like frogs? Sure. You know, you know, oh, yeah, you know, and then and everybody knows that I like frogs. So everybody brings me one mm -hmm. or sees one when they go traveling. And it's been kind of a cool thing. And, you know, there's lots of ways to make connections if we want to. Yeah, absolutely agree. And so if you don't find one immediately, you know, being prepared with those curious questions to get there, I think, is a great thing, especially if you're worried about tension in a meeting. You know, if you've got the opportunity to lead some of those questions, to just state it up front, you know, hey, I recognize there's been a lot of tension over the last few weeks in this team, or, you know, we've had a lot of hot discussions over the dinner table. I want to shift gears a little bit and let's find a point of connection. So I'm going to ask some questions and let's figure out where we align. I think you can be that direct. I think you can state that. And I think there might even be some appreciation for the fact that I'm acknowledging the elephant in the room. The elephant's going to stay. We've got to figure out a way to work around it. Yeah. And there's always really easy ways to do connections. There used to be this one called the five H's and it was originally, uh, I think, published for people who were introverts who had to go to networking functions, right? And it's like home, hobbies, hopes, and there's, you know, history and, and something else having to do with family. And, um, and, you know, and it's like, you know, there's, there's easy things. Like I said, if you're in the motivated bent to do it, if you're not, if you just want to have a fight. So I think the, 
the key here is if you're the person who wants to have a fight, well, then think about, okay, is that the best approach here? And if you decide to do it, well, then do it with gusto and get it over with. If you're the person who's trying to be the peacemaker and trying to find that connection, then there's ways to do that and find connection even with uh, even with the angry elf. Yeah, no, uh, good points. Very good points. So, you know, again, circling back to just maintaining that posture of curiosity, no matter what the weather brings tomorrow, right, with, uh, with the political storm afoot. I think we can really be prepared for all different types of conversations, all different types of environments. We've been talking about home settings. We've been talking about business settings. And, you know, we've talked in the past, too, about you also have the option to consider, is my investment into 24-hour news or is my investment into feeding this uh, information cycle beneficial to my health, to my knowledge, to my well-being? Does it actually serve me? And I think those are some also some good questions to maybe just even detach a little bit to say, okay, I've been consumed with media cons- or I've been consuming media exclusively for the last you know X number of weeks. And it is time to shut it down. It is time to not let my mind and my kind of soul be fed all of this news. And I need to be curious about how do I reground myself? How do I get back into the air and the sunshine and the, the things that are still going right? Well, and you're talking about obsession. And um, one of the quotes I've always loved is uh, even a good thing can become a bad thing if it becomes the only thing. Thing. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that's true. And you and I were both in a lecture recently where the guy said, Hey, I've turned off news entirely. I let my friends curate my news. In other words, it takes him two, two and a half nanoseconds in conversations with other people to figure out what's going on in life. And um, there was a, there was a person that this person really enjoyed listening to who had passed away. And he said, and I got texts uh, over the next few hours telling me, oh, did you know this person passed away? In other words, his point was, if you totally unplug from news, you're not going to not know what's going on. Right, right. <laughs> and so if 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 news and being plugged into news has become a problem, you know, identify the problem, admit the problem, mm-hmm. and then do something about it. And, you know, I guarantee that if you turn it off, and you don't listen to it and take a, a news break for a day or a week or whatever you're willing to put up with, you'll still know what's going on. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think let's kind of land the plane with maybe one or two curious questions that we can ask ourselves just in the midst of this climate right now to kind of reground, to recenter, and to make sure that we're focusing on relationships. So you have one that you can offer and maybe I'll think of one as well. Sure, I can just, I'll start with myself, which is, you know, a- am I going to be profoundly affected, you know, by the, the whatever happens over the tonight, next couple of days, to the point where I want it to hurt the relationships with myself and those around me? Mm. Um, if that answer is no, well, then, you know, how can I approach that? And just proactively think about the different situations I'm going to be in over the rest of the week and 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 beyond and you know what can i do to uh foster better relationships and add value to those around me yeah and i think i might throw in there you know have i let this election cycle take too much weight in my life and if i if the answer is yes what do i need to do to rebalance and what do i need to do to re-engage with relationships that may have been pushed by the to the side or may have been damaged by the weight that I've given this news cycle and this uh, political cycle? Good question. All right. Well, thank you, Gary. And we will wish everybody a great rest of your week. You are always welcome to contribute to the conversation through the website, which is curiositynotjudgment.com or right there on the YouTube channel. Leave us a note and we're happy to see what's on your mind. So until next week, we'll wish you a great one. And happy election day. Take care.